Broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne, this is Wilms Front, brought to you by theunshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wilms. So I've got uh, Ricardo uh, Bossi uh, up next. He is was a candidate uh, for the Australian Conservatives uh, party uh, for the, the New South Wales uh, Senate. He was sec second on the, the ticket uh, during the, the May federal election, of course, because of the party's uh, poor result at that federal election, getting less than 1% in most of the uh, Senate uh, races. Uh, Cory Bernardi, former Liberal senator who founded it, he has now deregistered Australian Conservatives, now sits as an independent. Uh, but uh, Ricardo Bossi, he has uh, picked up the baton and has uh, born out of the the ashes of the Australian Conservatives the Australia One A1 party. Now before I bring him on I'll just uh, play the party launch uh, video in case you haven't seen it which will be a good introduction. I'm Ricardo Bozzi a published author, international business consultant, former Australian Army Special Forces Lieutenant Colonel, and a former Senate candidate. And I am but one of many who are creating a new political party, Australia One. The reason for this is simple, because professional politicians in the major parties have ruined our country. And since the federal election in May 2019, little has changed. Useless green dreams, collapsing manufacturing, damaging education, weird gender ideologies, Islamic terror and Sharia law, a neutered military, denial of free speech, out of control immigration, full term abortion, African crime, suspect political donations, family court suicides, the globalist influence, failed water management, vote fraud, Centrelink fraud, and the list goes on and on. Did you vote for any of this? Australia's current future looks bleak and there are other futures that look worse and we need to change our trajectory. You see, we are under attack from foreign powers and ideologies and that's bad enough, but they are being aided and abetted by traitors in our parliaments and our public service, compromised judges in our courts, ineffectual police running our constabularies, cowards leading our military, ideological enemies in our universities, and propagandists in our media. I say our because it is you, the Australian people, who pay for or subsidise these institutions. These organs of state have been corrupted to the point where they no longer serve Australia, but themselves, foreigners and other special interests. The forces arraigned against us are titanic, and we are losing this battle because most Australians just can't see the threat and those who do see it and speak out are severely outnumbered, maligned, defamed and even silenced. Every generation has a role to defend what is good and to defeat that which threatens it. And like every generation, we will never face a more important responsibility. We must save Australia. We must ensure Australia remains a sovereign, self-reliant Judeo-Christian Western democracy, which is economically powerful militarily intimidating, politically free, culturally vibrant and socially cohesive. To do this, our nation needs decent men and women who are willing to commit everything to a cause greater than themselves. We need to build an army. An army ready to fight for our best future. An army ready to fight from local councils through to state and federal parliaments. Your voice is necessary. You don't have to be a parliamentarian, but you must fight for your family, your local community and your nation. Now is the time to step up and rise to this challenge. If you know the difference between right and wrong, if you know what you're willing to fight for, and if you truly have the courage of your convictions, Australia One is your party. Join us. We've got you on screen now, Ricardo. So welcome back. Uh, well, you were on the Unshackled Waves, my own own program originally. So welcome to my new program, Wilmsfront. 
Thank you and congratulations, Tim. Now, when we spoke, it was just after the, the federal election uh, where it was, it, we did a bit of a Australian Conservatives uh, post mortem, and that was before Cory Bernardi announced that uh, he uh, was, was intending to deregister uh, the party. It was also at the same time when uh, Samrat Grul and uh, Joel Jamal, they were attempting to reform the, the Christian Democrats. Ultimately, uh, they, they did not uh, succeed. And so there's the, the various uh, people who made up the, the senior uh, circle of uh, Australian Conservatives. Obviously, Cory Bernardi is still in the Senate sitting as an independent. Uh, he intends to uh, quit the Senate either at the end of this year or or next year. Lyle Shelton, who was the, the Australian Conservatives Queensland uh, Senate candidate and also former director of the Australian Christian Lobby, he now works for Mark Robinson, who's a state LNP uh, MP, and uh, Kevin Bailey, who uh, was the Australian Conservatives Victorian Senate candidate. He's applied to join the uh, Victorian Liberal Party. But uh, you and also uh, Sophie York, who was your uh, number one uh, candidate at the, the federal election, uh, uh, you've uh, decided that uh, Australians still need an alternate uh, conservative voice, and so you've launched... Uh, Australia uh, won. Uh, that there, there was a a lot of uh, I saw a chatter online about uh, what the party should be called, what the the logo is. But it was it was a nice uh, introductory video, and the the website mailing list is is up, and also you've just uh, launched the the Facebook page and group. Yeah, it's been an interesting little journey. Um, after the election, a number of us had a sense that. Uh, we had to take the cudgel up or it would be lost. Um, the, it was pretty clear that nobody wanted Labor and they held their nose and voted Liberal. I suspected and I'm being <laughs> persuaded even more every day that the Liberal Party will collapse under its own weight over time. Um, it's interesting you finished uh, that conversation with um, Alex Cameron and uh, the Deep State. We face exactly the same problem here. Not quite as sophisticated because uh, most Australians tend to overestimate their abilities, but we've got the same problem here in Australia and uh, we need to break it. Uh, the Liberal Labor Party, Nationals and Greens, they're deeply entrenched in all of it and we need somebody that's ready to take it on. Yes, we spoke about uh, probably the the biggest uh, challenger to the deep state over in the United States, uh, Tulsi Gabbard, who's a, a former uh, military combat veteran. You yourself, you're a former Australian Army Special Forces Lieutenant Colonel. You've had deployments uh, to uh, the, the Middle East. And it's, it's good that a lot of ex-military personnel decide to become involved in, in politics because... Uh, any type of domestic politics always comes to, to geo uh, politics. And I spoke with uh, Liam Quasha uh, a couple of Fridays ago. He's with uh, the Young Conservatives Queensland. He's, well, he's only 25, but he's already gained range of experience uh, in uh, the uh, Australian military, which, which has given him a, a unique geopolitical outlook and obviously uh, the work of uh, Andrew Hasty on uh, uh, China and also chair of the uh, Intelligence and Security uh, Committee, uh, obviously another uh, ex-SAS officer. So it seems that if you've ser served your country and also seen the world, it certainly gives you a unique perspective. Yeah, it's a lived experience. Uh, most Australians obviously have to take the word of the presenters on TV, but most of these people never stepped outside their five-star hotel in the capital city. When you've lived and worked for many, many, many years um, overseas, you get a, a better perspective. And the more military people that join up to either side of politics, and I'm quite happy with that, the better will be because it's the sheer competence, drive, dedication, focus that uh, service men and women bring is second to none. Uh, the current clowns in Canberra. Uh, I mean, I've seen there's nothing particularly impressive about them. They're timid. They're uh, 
their skill sets aren't terribly great. They don't know much. All they know is how to um, follow orders, and that's from the top man down. Well, the last fortnight in Parliament, it's been pretty mediocre from both sides because there's been this drought uh, in New South Wales and along the Murray-Darling Basin, which takes in four states, which has basically been festering for the entire time. The Morrison government <coughs> has been in charge federally and the, the Liberals and Nationals have been in charge in, in New South Wales. And the National Party, which is supposed to represent the Bush and farmers, what have they been doing for all that time? I had Ron Pike on last uh, Friday night, who's an uh, irrigation expert and basically said, Scott Morrison, Michael McCormack, you either need to fix this or resign. He was, he was pretty blunt. And, and Alan Jones, people who think that he's just a, a cheerleader for the Liberals, he's been, he was very uh, savage on Scott Morrison and, and the Nationals uh, last week. That's, I think that in the past few weeks has demonstrated just how government mismanagement, uh, while uh, we did uh, dodge a bullet uh, at the, the federal le election, just thinking that we could have had Bill Shorten as our Prime Minister right now. Uh, there's still a lot of problems facing our nation. It's not an accident. Um, it's, this is the exact intended result. We've had a uni party running this country for years now. It makes no difference. They're like two separate crime families vying over who's going to sell drugs on the block. But it makes no difference. They're controlled by the same people on the outside. And it's not an accident. It's not like Scott Morrison's stupid, isn't it? He knows exactly what he's doing. He's following orders. And it's, let me put it to you this way. It's almost like they have to break the farmers back so they can sell uh, Australian prime uh, agricultural land to the Chinese for one cent in the dollar. And uh, I read a line, um, whichever minister was responsible at the time, you know, not everyone's going to survive this. Well, this is the first tranche of farmers being removed and you want to be gobbled up. This is not, there's the, the, the solution to this is not difficult. The technical aspects to this are not difficult. It never is. There isn't a problem in this country that we can't fix right now, except for political will. And political will, brackets, dollars, is what drives the show. And there's no way you can convince me that either Liberal or Labor Party are actually working for the Australian people. They're not. They're working for somebody else. Now, you can work out for yourselves, and you know, we can talk about this in a little while, but there are five separate threats facing the country. And the 150 lower house MPs and the 76 senators in Canberra are facilitating that. It's a transfer of wealth from the average voters' pockets through the Treasury to somebody else. There is no way we should be as broke as we are, as dry as we are, as energy poor as we are. This is not an accident. This is exactly what the powers that run this country actually want. Now, there's been many attempts over the past 25 years to create a minor party on the on the right, a proper conservative or nationalist party. And we've seen, especially over the past uh, five years, a lot uh, uh, crash and, and burn. Obviously, there was in the 2016 uh, federal election, there was the Australian Liberty Alliance. They had high profile candidates with <clears throat> Kiralee Smith in New South Wales and Bernard Gaynor in Queensland. Uh, they didn't get more than 1% uh, of the vote. Obviously, at the 2019 federal election, uh, Fraser Anning, who was elected as a One Nation senator on Countback after Malcolm Roberts. Uh, was knocked out due to the Section 44 dual citizenship uh, crisis. He founded his Fraser Anning uh, Conservative National Party, which meant to be a... Because, obviously, I'm leaving out here that uh, One Nation, or Pauline Hanson's One Nation, it's still Australian Conservatives, Nationalists, they, they still vote for the, the woman and the party that they know in Pauline Hanson. We'll get to her in a moment. But Fraser Anning made a, a big impact and especially uh, created a lot of uh, controversy with uh, his, his statements and appearances, which, which gave him a, a great following. Uh, he got over 120,000 Facebook likes, but it still didn't translate to, to votes at the federal election. His party is still registered, but he's currently over in the, the United States. We've seen the Rise Up Australia Party, which is based in where I live uh, in southeastern Melbourne. That voluntarily 
deregistered, uh, which was founded by Danny Ninalia. And I had uh, Rosalie Cristani, who's the City of Casey councillor. She uh, was uh, probably the, the second most high profile person in that uh, party. The, the Democratic Labour Party is obviously uh, still around. They've occasionally won seats in the Victorian a parliament did have a, a senator and Christian Democrats there. Well, uh, when Fred's dead, that's pretty much going to be it, it seems. The time hasn't been right. The, uh, the Conservatives have been progressively pushed to the outer, again, by what could be called the deep state here. The, uh, the political media complex. Let's, let's talk about the alleged conservative uh, commentators on, um, on radio and TV. There's a term call for a, called a Judas goat. A Judas goat leads the sheep into the slaughterhouse, never gets slaughtered itself, but leads it there. And the alleged conservatives are happy to boost a particular party, but they do it from the comfort of a well-paid position and they won't speak about the things that really are going to hit hard because they'll get sacked. No, I understand that. Everybody needs to pay their bills. But you don't save a country that way. You don't run a country that way. So the Conservatives have been on the outer for a long time. And the time, to be fair, hasn't been right. People have been uh, swindled with a whole bunch of nonsense from a range of sources. But it, uh, as I said a couple of years ago at the New South Wales Conference for the Conservatives, they are overreaching now. They know that they've reached peak stupidity and they have to uh, they have to go for it now. And that's why they're trying so hard. Um, you see it all around. The, you see it all around the, the globe. Uh, Brexit vote. No, we don't want that. We'll keep giving you a referendum until you uh, until you give us the result we want. Happened in Ireland, happened in the UK. It's happening everywhere. They're doing it here, too. But things have changed now. Now, people are beginning to realize that the Liberal Party isn't the Labour Party isn't what they purport to be, what they started to be. And they are genuinely looking for something different. Now, that's something different better be bloody good, too, because they're sick to death of um, of uh, listening to nice words and then watch, watching people disappear the moment it gets a little bit tough. So if if the conservatives need to coalesce and they will and they and, and this 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 phase we're going through where there's a few parties and we're all elbowing each other for a bit of space, there's nothing wrong with that. That's called evolution. The toughest and best will survive and the rest will have to find a place to live. But that's OK. There's a new phase of Australian politics is about to start and both Liberal and Labor know it. And they're not long for this world. Now, I mentioned uh, One Nation, which uh, they, uh, Pauline Hanson, returned to Australia's parliament in the, the Senate in, in 2016. Uh, Malcolm Roberts, uh, he was re-elected at the, the, the 2019 federal election. He's back in the, the Senate. And of course, uh, Mark Latham uh, won an upper house seat uh, at the New South Wales state election, well, his uh, running mate, uh, Rod Roberts, won one uh, as well. Obviously, One Nation has a lot of uh, its internal problems uh, are well uh, documented, but in your view, what is wrong with One Nation and uh, Pauline, uh, I, I won't say, but what's your opinion on Pauline Hanson and Mark Latham? It's an easy one. I love Pauline. I think she's fantastic. She's got a bigger set of onions than most men have. I think she's tremendous. And she, there's a, there's a line that was attributed, not attributed to, but used to describe Trump, uh, written by a, a journal in the Atlantic Monthly. And he summed it up nicely. Trump's supporters took him seriously, but not literally. Uh, the critics took him literally, not seriously. And that's where the pundit class in Australia get it so wrong. See, Pauline and Mark Latham, two stellar performers, they really are. Um, people should take them seriously because these are two serious people. Now, whether whether the, the organisation around them is perfect, and we know it's not, and, and we know that there are dramas, with, particularly around Pauline. But the two people, they better take them seriously because the people that vote for them don't believe what comes across the TV. And th those numbers are growing. Um, the numbers... Uh, out of New South Wales could easily have been double what uh, Mark Latham pulled in with One Nation. There's a huge mass of people ready to move, but they need to be persuaded. They need to be convinced. They need to trust that the people selling them an idea are there for the long haul. Uh, supplementary question to that. Why isn't One Nation the party for, for you or uh, other Australian conservatives? 
That's a really good question. On a personal level, uh, I've spent a lot of time following orders. I've had enough because uh, I'm reasonably well trained. I know how to uh, to survey the landscape, decide which battles to fight, how to fight them, when to fight them, and uh, it's time to do it. Well, as they say, if you want done something done right, you do it yourself. And so I'm tired of compromising and and hedging and um, all the stuff that normally goes on in politics. Let's try something new. In fact, I, I broke a cardinal rule of politics just recently, not long ago, a couple of months ago. I stabbed somebody in the front rather than in the back and, and people were horrified. How dare you tell someone to their face exactly what you think of them? You should be like the rest of us. No, no, this is too serious a business. And uh, this, is, this is serious and we're gonna lose the country. Those of us who look behind the curtain know exactly what's really going on and the foundational damage that has been done over the last 60, 70 years. Um, this is serious business. We need serious people to fix it. And the clowns, uh, there's no room for them. They won't last long. And in my organization, uh, we don't have time for that, as I was telling one of our uh, supporters today. Unless you're hard, unless you're smart, there's no role here for you. This is, this is not kindergarten. I'm not going to hold people's hands. You know, no, you need to know how to take a punch and you need to know how to throw a punch, figuratively, of course, but do it and do it hard. Well, yeah, I, I can assure you in the, the next election cycle, you're probably going to get punched from, from all angles uh, politically. Uh, what, <laughs> as you can see, what's happened with Trump the, the past three years, uh, that he's just been under attack constantly but his response has been uh attack 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 counter attack hit the enemy uh, 10 times harder which i think you would probably agree with as a good strategy oh you got to play your own game and trump trump knows trump and he knows how to play trump nobody can be be trump he plays a great game and he has them guessing uh at every turn he really does he's a master uh i'm a little di bit different i'll be playing my game my way when i need to hit i will uh, but one thing I learned from Trump is a master class. He never attacks unless he means to kill. He doesn't waste words. He just gets on with the job. Uh, and as Churchill said, if you stop at every barking dog, you'll never make your way down the street. Now, obviously, you are the, the founder of Australia One, but it's not titled Ricardo Bossi's Australia One Party. There was a lot of... Uh, even though Australian Conservatives was called that, there was still a lot of perception by party <clears throat> members that it was Cory Bernardi's Australian Conservatives Party. And what uh, some of the former members who are now members of your party are wanting a wanting to have more of a say, more input in the party uh, going forward. Is is that what you plan to to do? What lessons are you going to take from that aspect of Australian Conservatives? No, that's exactly right. That's exactly why we're going to be different to every other party. If you've read John Ruddick's book, Make the Liberal Party Great Again, I'm using that as my Bible. So thanks, John. And there's still a job for a federal director of the party when the Liberals eventually collapse. Feel free to give me a bell. I'll take you on. The way it's going to work is this. And here's just a couple of examples. Um, when it comes time for candidates, I'm not interested in someone turning up saying, look, I can stack the branches and uh, I've raised so much money. The way we're running it very soon, and it'll be starting in the new year once we've got the constitution and policy platform sorted. If you want to be a, a candidate for uh, the seat of Upper Kumbakta West, let's say, you better start working your tail off in Upper Kumbakta West, running every sausage sizzle, supporting every, every possible local event. So you get to work your electorate and get known in your electorate. And then you will earn the right to represent them. That's the way it works. They better, when it comes to voting time, they're not going to vote for a, a T-shirt or a logo. I want our candidates' faces so well known in the local community that they walk up, shake their hands and say, Jacko, I hope you make it, mate. You've, you've looked after us for the last two and a half years. It's our turn to look after you. So on one point, they get to own their electorate. They also get to speak because this nonsense about having a single head is, is just, it's just bad strategy. The, the locals need to vote for somebody they know, like and trust. And that's the three phases that each candidate's got to go through. Step number two, we're going to take a leaf out of uh, Ruddick's book again. Recall elections. Anybody, anybody that doesn't perform within my party, the 10% of the members say, let's get rid of the federal director or the state director or anybody. 10% want to get rid of you because you're not doing the right job. You face a recall election. And if you don't win, you're out. And in fact, that's something we'd like to introduce into Australian politics, recall elections. 
See, at the moment, every politician tells lies and promises. We know that, nothing special. And then for three years, they say and do nothing that you actually want until they come back and they say, here's my blue shirt, please vote for me. Here's my red shirt, please vote for me. But it's a lie. But can you imagine every electorate in the country can conduct a recall election on their local member because all of a sudden that uh, local member has taken a position at variance with their expressed wishes. All of a sudden you've got a local member who is responsive to the electorate 365 days a year instead of just once at election time. That's the way we're going to run the party. You have to earn your place and you have to fight to keep it. There's, I'm not sure if you're aware of the term candidates uh, disease, but it can affect a lot of people where they believe that just by running a Facebook ad campaign or maybe putting some billboards up or a few local TV <laughs> ads that they're going to win. No, the people use the expression, you've got to, you campaign your socks off. That's literally what you have to do. You basically have to dedicate 12 to 18 months of your life, give up all of your weekends to 10 community events because voters they're not going to vote most a lot of them are not going to vote for you unless they know you have had a chat with you they're the people who are going to elect you you've got to be able to to answer uh, their question and there is a lot of a uh, especially those who either create or join minor parties uh, uh, they, they do have a lot of the delusions of grandeur where they where they think that this they're going to magically rise uh, uh, to the top, but I'll, I'll mention another aspect of, of your uh, CV, that you're a, a leadership strategy and innovation uh, consultant. You're also a motivational uh, speaker. You're an author of, uh, we spoke about it uh, on uh, your previous appearance, Greatness Awaits You, the five pillars of, of real leadership. So you're under no uh, delusions. This isn't a vanity project, some pipe dream. It's, you want to do it seriously, dedicate huge hours out of your week to it. When I was contesting the position for the Senate candidate, somebody asked me, what do you do if you don't get in? I said, I'd do exactly what I'm doing now. I'll just do it differently. When you plan a, a military strategy, you set your intention. And this is really important for people to understand. Intention comprises three parts, purpose, method, end state. Purpose, what you're going to do, method, how you're going to do it, end state, what the world looks like when you're finished. Don't worry about method. Being a, being a senator was a method to achieve an end state. Now, the, the purpose was to save the country. And the end state was, as you can see in the, in the video, a sovereign, self-reliant, Western Judeo-Christian Western democracy. That's the end state. Now, they said to me, what happens if you don't get in? I said, I'll just go door to door, just doing exactly what I'm doing now. We've got to save the country. And the only way the country can be saved, and that's not a flight of fancy or, a, or an overly emotive word. We are losing this nation on every possible level, it is being destroyed. But we need to save it, and we will only save it if we deserve to save it. And that requires, as the video says, an army. This can't be done from the air. This needs to be done door to door, street to street, suburb to suburb. And I'll be pushing our candidates, get involved at the council level first. And we've got a great bloke called Josh Shoebridge down in Eden Monaro. And he's uh, taking on a one-man campaign against green lunacy in Eden Monaro. And he's working his tail off to earn the right to do that down in, down there. And, uh, and that's exactly the, what, we, what we've got to do. Get involved at council level, get involved at uh, state level, and get involved in federal level. Now, the thing about conservatives, they love sitting back over a Chardonnay and discussing finer points of political theory and, and tactics. You know, the, the, the political equivalent of how many uh, angels can you fit on the head of a pin. I don't need that. I don't need more advice. I've got plenty of advice. What I need is some heavy lifters. So if people want to join a party to sit back and, and cruise into a, a pre-selection slot, forget it. Go find another party. You earn your place. You work your tail off. Get the support of the local members. Get them to love you. And then you've earned your right to be there. Now, obviously, the, the party is going to begin uh, in New South Wales. And that's, I would say, it's now Australia's most conservative state. It had the, the lowest uh, yes vote uh, in the, the same-sex marriage uh, postal survey. And we have seen with the, the recent uh, protests against the abortion decriminalization bill, which if it had passed in its purest form when it was, uh, it was 
they tried to sneak it in uh, into the New South Wales Parliament over a, over a weekend without any consultation. Uh, there was just in the first week there was a ground a grassroots swell of opposition to that. All different community groups coming together. No, we we don't want to live in a state which allows babies to be killed up until birth. And uh, thankfully, there were many good uh, pro-life liberal MPs. They had to basically put their careers uh, on the line. Uh, Tanya Davies, uh, Nathaniel Smith, uh, I'm probably <coughs> uh, leaving out a, a few others. But there was a lot of New South Wales conservatives who saw this as a great betrayal that Gladys Berejiklian, and the, the, the liberal premier that they campaign for and her partner in arms, uh, Deputy Premier Nationals Leader John Barillaro, would not say a peep during the New South Wales state election and attempt to steamroll this through uh, the parliament. And there is a lot of still anger and feelings of betrayal at the, the Liberals and Nationals. And we've seen in rural New South Wales that uh, uh, they've had enough of the National Party there and there's now three Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party MPs in the, the lower house and are doing great work on especially uh, water and obviously you're based in the Sydney city but there's certainly in the rural part of the state they're willing to vote for an alternate party so it's certainly that uh, fiasco and betrayal by by Gladys has, has certainly there's a void that you can fill uh, if things are done right. Oh, absolutely. Good for nothing, Gladys. Good for nothing, Gladys. Well, here's a warning, Gladys. You and every MP that voted for that bill will pay at the next election. Every last one of you. And it's not just you personally, because you'll pay, but the Liberal Party. Now, you've got to ask yourself, step back and just, just observe the scene. Why did that bill have to get pushed through with such unseemly haste? Why? It didn't make sense. Was this a pressing issue? Here's a little, here's a little stretch of the imagination. Trump defunded Planned Parenthood in the US. They need, it's a business model, they need body parts. Now your, your, your viewers might be a bit shocked by this, but here's a few facts for you. The body parts from a early term abortion fetus garners the abortion provider, the abortionist um, and its, his organization about $50,000. That's what the body parts are worth. A late term abortion is worth half a million. And they needed supply. And good for nothing Gladys and her loathsome Liberal Party and their loathsome Labor mates did what they were told, they followed orders and they pushed this bill through. And it's interesting pay. to note that uh, if you mentioned the, the body parts sale, that amendment to prevent the sale of dead baby body parts was voted down. So that what is... What a surprise. Is, I'm shocked. I'm absolutely shocked. You know what? There you go. I rest my case. This is... And, and you would understand this isn't uh, politics as usual now. A policy here, a policy there. Let's divide the electorate into its market segments. We'll give the Muslims this, we'll give the, the Greeks that, we'll give the islanders something else. If you notice in that video, I describe an end state. And that's what every policy that we will push will contribute to. And then people can ask me, what's your policy on this? Well, I say, well, does it help us make us a sovereign, self-reliant, Judeo-Christian Western democracy? If the answer is yes, it stays in. But they don't do that. They break it down into segment parts and they just do what they need to do. And Gladys will go and she'll get... She'll get uh, given a, a high, high paid job somewhere like the rest of them, she will have done her duty for her masters and she'll go somewhere else and get paid. I think maybe it's my opinion. I'm just guessing. I don't know this for certain. Of course, she might be a, a thoroughly um, reputable individual. But her behavior seems to indicate something else. Well, it's it seems to she's gone back to, to business as as usual but as i mentioned the the second uh, pro life rally in in sydney's i think it was hyde park got 10,000 people that's a massive turnout for uh, as you mentioned there there's too many conservatives who are sitting at home uh, not not taking action in in real life and 
spending a bit too much time on on Facebook just being angry uh, in the comments, which which it expresses a public view, but only gets you uh, so far. But <laughs> obviously, the next uh, Victor uh, New South Wales state election is not until March uh, 2023. We're not going to have a federal election until uh, May uh, or at least uh, the second half of uh, 2021. Uh, so. But the, the, obviously the, there was this groundswell six months after an election and people do have, especially in the internet age, long memories. They remember everything's captured uh, these days. And so if you lie uh, to the voters before the election, that can easily be put together in say 20 minute video to basically communicate to the public, look how you betrayed them at the, the last election. So sure, uh, Gladys, uh, she, she won't be facing an election for uh, another three and a half uh, years, but uh, people's memories are, are much longer now and information is much easier to, to get out. And this is what I was talking about with uh, Alex uh, before, that the, the mainstream media in cahoots with the political class, uh, they can't uh, achieve the, the same, same level of collusion that they used to. Mm, I think you're right. And uh, social media connectivity, speed of communications has facilitated what is going to become a, uh, a groundswell against traditional politics. We're not going to get a revolution in Australia. Australians are, are not that way inclined, which is probably a good thing. But they're going to have to respond to ways they never had to before. Probably about a decade ago, the, the talk of the future of the right was uh, fusionism between conservatism and libertarianism but i'd say in 2019 the the question for the right is or the i i would say the task for the right is probably uh, fusioning conservatism and nationalism because we've seen a resurgence in uh, nationalism and patriotism australia in in the united states trump he has explicitly called himself a, a nationalist he got up in the united states United Nations and said the future belongs to patriots, not globalists. We've seen in Latin America, Jair Bolsonaro uh, become president of Brazil, Sebastian Kurz in Austria, he won re-election. Look at what's happening in, in Poland, their uh, Nationalist Party got uh, re-elected. And obviously there are different uh, strands of, of nationalism. The main two are civic nationalism and uh, white nationalism which in my opinion uh, australia being in the asia pacific region and give, uh, gi given that we are so close to many different cultures uh, white nationalism is 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 quite is quite a <clears throat> a high uh, goal uh, to to aim for but i don't think it's plausible or even uh, necessary but i definitely think the a lot of what nationalists of all persuasions are asking for is uh, control of immigration, the return of, of sovereignty, who, who comes and a say over the immigration mix, because you and I both agree, not all cultures are equal. <laughs> you couldn't have said it better. In terms of the nationalism, you're exactly right. Uh, I remember if you listen carefully to what the deep state says over the years, you know, you can pick their agenda so you know how to fight back. And Clinton, uh, Bill, when he was president, was making statements that, uh, you know, nationalism is not necessarily a good thing anymore. And this is a long time ago. So they telegraph their punches if, if you pay attention. Now, the, you've got ethno-nationalism and civic nationalism. The ethno-nationalism is race-based and the civic is basically values or culture-based. Um, I agree with you. The ethno-nationalism, it has a, it will find a home in certain countries. It doesn't work here. We're too much of a, uh, a melting pot in a good sense. Everybody came here and became an Aussie. I remember my, my aunts came from Italy and they brought Italian extra, uh, accents yelling out, Gan sin kilda, which was, uh, you know, they were the most Aussie, <laughs> Aussie women you could find with their broad Italian accents. So the, the rise of nationalism is a good thing. The globalists are trying to create some sort of global Tower of Babel. We all look and speak the same. And I can understand that because when you, when you travel the world five star and every country is a five star hotel, I've lived that lifestyle and it's very attractive, I can tell you. 
and it doesn't which city you land in. You get picked up at the airport. The black Merc picks you up, drops you at a five star. You do what you've got to do, then you hop in the black Merc, go back to the airport and go. And every city is exactly the same. Every country is exactly the same. But they forgot one thing. They never asked us, do you want your country to change? And of course, they didn't ask us. They decided for us that they had an agenda. And uh, one of those aspects, and it's just, just one, the globalist agenda, is to, uh, is to breed out the separate races. And they're doing that in Australia now. They're bringing in as many non-Judeo-Christian Anglo-Celtics as they can. And yes. that's not an, not an accident. It's not an accident. There's, there's definitely a, a high degree of not just anti-white racism. Well, it's termed a conspiracy theory, white genocide. But there, there's actually young... Uh, white people today who say that uh, they wouldn't want to give birth to a white child because they have white privilege these are these are real st statements and of course uh, there's the, the the climate change uh extinction rebellion they're now not having children for the the sake of the planet and going well that's just, a good thing <laughs> yeah well we don't need any more uh left <laughs> uh, left left-wing uh, children uh, out, out out on the streets well well that's why they don't have children themselves it seems uh, the the left and the and the teachers that's why they indoctrinate uh, our, our children but i just want to go back to uh talking about uh, white nationalism or ethnic nationalism i think the reason we have seen a resurgence of it is because the flood of immigration has just increased so much is there's not assimilation like there used to be. I mean, you're obviously of, uh, your family is of Italian uh, ethnicity, but you're not uh, go, uh, f going around like with your uh, promoting a like Italian Australian culture, you consider yourself an Australian. And that's what we've seen like with because uh, the Italians and Greeks came in the, the the 50s and then we had the Vietnamese uh, come in the 70s the the Vietnamese they're probably the best refugees that we have they absolutely hate communism they they held anti-communism rallies uh, before it was cool about uh, six months ago but because it was it was a steady flow they were forced to assimilate and one of the disadvantages of the the digital age is that you can basically be connected with your native culture there's no you don't have to assimilate at all and it's much easier to set up ghettos in various suburbs it's exactly right it's it is uh the there is no requirement anymore but in terms of conspiracy is it a conspiracy theory no it's 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 actually measure measurable it's it's fact and if you, if you want sort of evidence that alluding to that, uh, the New World Order, there's another conspiracy theory. You know, get your tinfoil hat on, fellas. Let's, uh, let's talk New World Order. Well, that's not a conspiracy either. Look, I'll show you. Let's see if you can see this. Uh, no, I can't I'll say it. I'll, it's okay. I'll read it. I'll read it out to you. It's a Senate document, Australian government. The Senate Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs and Defence the New International Economic Order Implications for Australia, 1980. So back in 1980, the Australian government was reviewing the implications of this new international, new international economic order. The new, word, the new word for that is New World Order. And in the document, basically what it says is the Australians have to deindustrialize, depopulate, deagriculturalize because we need to give the developing nations a fair go. Now that might be a laudable uh, goal. The methodology is ridiculous, but it's, it might be a laudable goal. But the trouble is they never asked us. They just decided to do it. And, and this comes back to um, what we were talking about at the beginning. Uh, it is not an accident that these things are happening, that the farms are being, the farmers are being broken, that electricity is expensive. They need to destroy our manufacturing. They need to destroy our agriculture. They need to destroy the country. All they want for Australia, those who are trying to control us is a mine that's all they need they don't need us we get in the way and i won't mention specific names but you've got to be a bit suspicious when a former prime minister tells the security agencies to stop being so anti-china when a liberal minister before he even retires from parliament is on an eight hundred thousand dollar a year 
package with a Chinese corporation with links to the Communist Party. You've got to be suspicious when a Labor senator is warning a Chinese donor that he might be being tapped by ASIO. Now, yeah, come on, we're not that stupid. We can see what's going on, fellas. They've been stripping the country. They've been working for somebody else and they never bothered asking us whether we were happy with that or not. And what they've done is they have they have created the monster of, of nationalism because they've gone too far and they've gone too fast. And guess what? We want our country back. I'll also add to that that Gladys Berejiklian's uh, predecessor, Mike Baird, uh, after he resigned, he's with one of the, the big banks earning a, a good salary. Uh, Anna Bly, who was a uh, former Queensland Premier, she's now the, the president of the Australian Bankers Association, the chief lobbyist uh, for them. So that gives you another indication. And of course, there was uh, Christopher Pine, former defence minister, now uh, is a part-time consultant for a, a firm that deals in the defence industry, but uh, that didn't break uh, parliamentary rules. Julie Bishop uh, now is is cons uh, part, uh, consulting for an aid organisation when she was the foreign minister in charge of divvying out a foreign aid. That also didn't break the, the rules as well. So that's a few other examples. Yeah, it's, um, I wonder if there's a connection between that. I just wonder, you know, I, I'm just not sure. And now we will take uh, questions from uh, the audience uh, before we finish. Uh, there's a few here in Entropy. I'll put the link in the the, the chat again. But uh, before we go to questions, I just want to ask you about uh, religious uh, freedom because that's something that uh, Scott Morrison, even though he is a very religious man uh, <laughs> himself, uh, his government hasn't... They, they haven't known how to... Uh, draft uh, this religious uh, discrimination act and try to please uh, everybody. And I know that you're going to be a speaker at a religious uh, freedom forum uh, next week. Uh, do you just want to promote that uh, for a moment? Sure. It's at Macquarie University. Uh, it'll be myself, Mark Latham, and Dr. Con Cafetaris. Mark, obviously, leader of One Nation, former ALP leader, Don uh, Con Cafetaris. Australian Christian Alliance founder and leader of that organization. And it's a, a non-party political discussion on the issue of uh, religious freedom. Mark's putting up a bill to try to nail that down. Um, and we'll be discussing that at Macquarie University. What is satisfactory to you in terms of governments uh, protecting religious freedom? Because obviously you're not satisfied with the federal government's draft bill, neither are the, uh, uh, the, the leading churches in Australia. Yeah, their bill is a freedom from religion bill, which is an agenda, again, nothing to do with the Liberal Party. They've been told to do it, so they're doing it. Christian Porter thinks he's the smartest man in the room, and that's always a great adversary to have because their arrogance is just their weak point. Um, this is a, it depends on, on how you want to look at this, but it is a, a deeply philosophical and complex question, but I'll try to break it down as easily as I can. What constitutes religion? What is a legitimate religion? Because if someone turns up and says, I kill my dogs on Saturdays, in the front yard and that's my religion do we give that guy freedom the same rights that we give to a an established religion that has thousands of years of of, of history and and revelation and um benefiting humanity and this is where everybody runs away because they're terrified to say well that's not a religion and this is well guess what folks you get a choice you're actually allowed to have an opinion on this stuff and just because somebody says it's a religion it ne it's not necessarily a religion then you look at the religions that have done good on the planet and the ones that have not done good on the planet. Should they be given the same protections? Now, the politicians will say, well, you know, there's votes there. There's votes there. We better we better do that. Well, maybe, maybe not. It needs to be looked at far more intelligently. There are religions that are powers for good and there are religions that are not. And uh, like culture, not all religions are a path to God. It's like saying all alcohol, all drinks are a path to sobriety. That's just nonsense. Well, I think that any religion which or well, preaches or it's it implements aggression against a person uh, that that is a problem. I think you know which religion 
I'm talking about. But religion, you ask, what is religion? It's, I, to, to me, it's a, it's a belief because at the end of the day, we don't know what's on the other side, what's above. And that's why it's called faith uh, belief. And I myself as am an atheist, but I can't prove that there's, there's no God or, or that. That's why I call it a, a belief as well. And of course you have the, the freedom to believe in a God or no God. You have the right to believe that there's aliens above or uh, Feng Shui, which is all about the, the spirit uh, uh, energy. But of course, when like, for example, uh, female genital mutilation, thankfully our high court ruled that it was not uh, religious freedom, which is an important uh, precedent. Uh, but the tricky thing is that, uh, and it's come to fruition with the Israel Falau saga, is that in the era of woke uh, corporations, is that I would say any unpopular belief, whether it be religious or, or not, I mean, it was Israel Falau's Instagram post was based on his religious belief, but we've also seen recently nationalists uh, have their, their bank account closed because of or unspecified or commercial uh, reasons which everyone says corporations are entitled to their own free speech because they're people uh, too. But what happens when these corporations are so powerful that they they are even more powerful than the, the state, the original oppressor? Mm. It's um, We're at the fortunate position of now being able to decide what we want with this country. And the best way to discuss this issue from my perspective is from the secular uh, p position. We get to decide what it was because the concept of freedom of religion made sense when 90 percent of the country believed in the same thing it was you didn't need to specify but that's now changing so we need to look at this from a purely secular perspective forget religion forget your, your particular religion but from a purely secular perspective what is best for the country and you have to have an understanding of the country let's let's take an extreme position let's have no religion okay there is no religion you're not allowed to have any religion there is no religion. Well, we well a couple of countries tried that over yes. the last hundred years, and that worked a real bomb, didn't it? You know, if, uh, how many Chinese dead? Twenty right. sixty-six million Chinese. You know, whatever the socialists, and then I include the uh, the Soviets and the, the the National Socialists in Germany under Hitler and Mao. Congratulations, fellas, you did a bang up job. A hundred million dead. So you, you just look at it and say, right, a country with no religion, the track record ain't great. And then you look at other religions and say, okay, well, this religion has killed, allegedly, what's the number? Oh, 270 million uh, since they were founded in 635 by Muhammad. 80 million Indians were killed in the process. Just fantastic stuff. So you look at your history and just purely from a, from a, um, a secular perspective, you say, well, we get to decide <clears throat> who gets the freedom of this thing called religion. And then you've got another religion where, you know, silly old white men did things like ban slavery and paid compensation to slaveholders. We get to we have to grow up. We have to actually now decide what we want. And this requires uh, intelligent, educated and erudite debate, not pinheaded politicians in Canberra trying to figure out whether they can swing three extra Muslim votes in the, uh, the western suburbs of Sydney. This is the future of the country at stake. But we have children in Canberra running the show. But this is really important. This is bigger than just Israel Falau. This is huge. This determines what this country will look like in 50, 100, 150 years time. And we've got historical precedent right there and the numbers are there. And if we got any, we've got any number of paths to go down, but if we choose the wrong one, this country isn't going to be worth living in anymore. Well, is the, the treatment of Israel Falau, there was a interesting contrast when uh, Carl Sanderlands, who's probably Australia's most famous uh, FM uh, shock jock, uh, said on his KISS FM radio program that if you believe the story of the, the Virgin Mary, you're as uh, dumb as uh, dog shit. And he probably wasn't expecting there to be a, a protest outside KISS FM the, the next Monday morning. Uh, it seems to be made up that crowd of both Lebanese, Muslims and Christians. And they made the point, how come Israel Falau gets uh, his uh, career ruined, but 
uh, Kyle Sanderlands is allowed he allowed to say that he did apologize, but it's interesting that he and his co-host uh, uh, Jackie Henderson they've just gotten a pay rise and they'll be earning not just a seven figure salary but eight figures over the next phase of their their contract. So they've got a massive <laughs> pay, but like obviously if if Kyle wants to make fun like of christianity like that's his his free speech obviously a lot of people found that offensive as probably the most offensive thing to christianity is the 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 piss christ uh show but that, that that's the thing it's free speech is also it's it offend like what people say offends people and it seems that it's only one side whose offense taking is legitimate well, that's again not an accident. First of all, I'm a I'm a almost in a free speech extremist. You know, sticks and stones will break my bones, but names will never hurt me. I learned that when I was eight in third grade. But it's um, no, sorry, I've lost the point I was going to make now. Oh, the, never mind. Uh, that uh, only one side is allowed to take offence. Oh yeah, no, that's not an accident. Um, one of the five threats that uh, this country has been dealing with in the last for the last seventy years, at least is socialism slash communism. And I've mentioned this previously, I'll mention it again because there might be some new listeners who haven't uh, read it or seen it. Get onto Google and Google the 45 goals of the Com US Communist Party. It was written by a gentleman called, a book. the book was called Naked Communist by W. Cleon Skousen. Uh, and in it, he enumerated the 45 goals of the Communist Party in the 50s. And you can tick off all the goals that they have achieved. And if you want to see exactly why Christianity is targeted, but other ones aren't, it's in the book. Because they, they understood better than us what makes Western civilization work. And like termites, termites, they got into the foundations and started gnawing away at the, the wooden beams. And it's starting to collapse. Christianity is one, the natural family is another. See, all these clever little young kids, and by young I mean anybody under the age of 40, that think that they believe what they believe because they're wise and intelligent and they can make up their own minds. They don't realize they've been played all their lives. All their lives. Read the book, check the 45 goals out, and you'll realize that you've been conned. Utterly conned. You know nothing about history. You know nothing about politics. You know nothing about culture. And you sit there thinking, yeah, let's take the piss out of the Christians, but hey, don't say anything about the Muslims because, you know, they'll cut my head off. Or uh, don't don't make any jokes about the the LGBT uh, people. That's also a big no no, as uh, Dave Chappelle found out. Exactly. <laughs> Say what you like. I don't care. No, in fact, uh, I I would say their best comedy is just one that offends everybody. Like. Uh, I'm not sure if you uh, the Fat Pizza program, which is which is coming back. We'll see how <laughs> how that goes. But that was great because it just had a go at everybody. If you felt victimised, well, so did everyone else. Yeah, I mean, I remember watching um, my son showed me what's it called, the Wog Show. Um, There's been a few matter. of them. Yeah, and it's just it's just in fact it was okay. Let me give you a, a personal example. 1989. The uh, Wog's out of work. I went to see the show, and uh, I was in uh, the 5th, 7th Battalion out at Holsworthy, and a bunch of us went out, and there was a, a mate of mine, Con, who was obviously a Greek, and I was the Italian, and we had another mate who was uh, born and bred true blue Aussie. And we're all sitting in the show watching Wog's out of work, and we're crying with laughter, because you know, we could see our ch ch childhood on stage. Um, you know, the other kids turn up with Vegemite sandwiches, and we turn up with a tongue sandwich, you know, things like that. And our Aussie mate was roaring along with us until they started taking the mickey out of the Australians. And then he sat stone-faced and he wouldn't laugh after that. So he could give it but couldn't take it. You've got to be a bit tougher than that. You know, life's tough enough. And um, this, this, if you can't take, a, if you can't take a, a laugh, then you're on the wrong planet. Go find somewhere else to live. Yes, we've forgotten how to laugh. That's another big uh, problem. I think maybe Australia One needs a... A comedy policy. <laughs> Eighteen C, kill it, kill yes, it fast. That's a that's a good good idea. Now we are just past uh, nine p.m. Melbourne time, so I just finish off by going through these questions. There's not too many. Uh, Bieber anti bullying. Uh, that's their username. Says will Ricardo Bossy outlaw the heinous sin of usury in Australia? Do you know what that is? Lending money for interest. Yes. 
Yeah. The system runs on it. I got a bigger problem with fake fake money. I got a problem with uh, creating money out of thin air. Yeah, uh, paper money uh, that, uh, well, our reserve banker that basically confessed they want to print more of it, uh, rob us through inflation or, no, they call it quantitative easing. And quantitative easing, rates. it's a great word, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, no. Uh, Peter V has got two questions here. Uh, what is your stance on third world immigration, especially Islamic, abolishing or cutting the immigration rate? I think we sort of answered that unless you want to clarify anything. Oh, yeah. No, it, um, okay. Kill it. Stop it. Dead. Dead. Zero? If you, zero. Until we, until we can fix the, the infrastructure, until we get things sorted out. But it's not just simply a matter of that. It's also where they come from. It's where they come. Let me give you an example. Uh, take a wild guess of what percentage of Afghans want Sharia law. And Sharia law, for those who aren't familiar with it, that's where a woman's testimony in court is worth half of that of the man. If a woman is raped, she needs four male witnesses to testify the rape took place. Otherwise, it didn't. So that's Sharia. So what percentage of Afghans want Sharia? Anybody? Hands up. Correct. 99%. So 99 out of 100 Afghans want Sharia law. So is that a country we want to be bringing into Australia? I don't think so. And you can just keep going around the planet because it's a cultural thing. It's not racism, it's just smart. So we get to pick who we bring here, why we bring them here, keep the mix about right, because we like the country the way it is. There's a reason why people are coming to Australia. It's a Christian, Judeo-Christian Western democracy. And built into that is everything that made it what it is. And if you keep bringing other elements to it, it ceases to be that and it becomes like the rest of the planet. And I've been in the fortunate position where I've lived and worked for years in less salubrious places than Oz. And final question is also from Peter V. Uh, with the possible religious discrimination laws, would, would that give rise to a national blasphemy laws, which I think is the, the ultimate thing which all parties uh, want to avoid? Oh, they've already got it in, uh, they've already got it in ACT, and that's what they want right. to bring in. They well, want to it. bring in blasphemy. They want to bring it in. They will tell you they're against it. But our wonderful ASIO chief, Duncan Lewis, refused to comment because he was afraid he might be blasphemous. Now, that's a bit of a concern. Well, we've got in Victoria the Racial and Religious Tolerance Act uh, 2002, which uh, the first high-profile target of that was uh, uh, Danny Nialia uh, when he was simply quoting what was in the Quran and uh, currently uh, appealing uh, his conviction under it is, is Blair Cottrell for the the United Patriots front uh, mock beheading during their activism against the, the Bendigo uh, Moss. So yes, we do have one in Victoria. In fact, uh, Fiona Patton, who's the, the Reason Party MLC in the Upper House, wants to introduce universal hate speech laws, which will cover everything and will cover internet uh, trolling uh, as well. It's been termed 18C on steroids, which I think is putting it mildly. Yeah. The end of the world is nigh. If that happens, forget it. It's game over. Well, uh, I'm sure you're under no illusion. I'll, I'll, I'll finish this by saying you've got monumental task uh, ahead of you, but uh, uh, you're you're more than uh, ready for the the challenge, and you've got quite a quite a bit of time before the next uh, state and federal election. But in the meantime, if people are interested in learning more or perhaps joining, getting on the, the mailing list, how can they do that? Go to the website, australiaoneparty.com. That's australiaoneparty.com. Put your details in. And as we grow, uh, we'll let you know what we're doing and how they can get involved. And I'll certainly have you back on in the, the not too distant future to for a, a progress uh, report, because it's, it's certainly something uh, we uh, at The Unshackled will uh, be interested in in uh, monitoring and, and reporting on. Thanks, Tim. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Thanks for tuning in to Wilmsfront. Visit timwilms.com or Rational Rise TV to view the archive of episodes. And keep visiting theunshackled.net to view all our shows and to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.